Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Galveston. We are glad you have joined us today and pray this service will be a blessing to you. Let us call ourselves to worship. God has made it clear who we are and whose we are. We are children of God and we belong to him. Yes, we are God's children by his choice and he wants us to be that choice too. May, may the way we live reveal our praise and thanksgiving for being part of God's family. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us for our sins and cleanse us for all unrighteousness. So let us now confess our sin before Almighty God. We are grateful, O oh God, to be your children but we know there are times that we act as though we cannot care in being your children. Forgive us when we take our identity so lightly and give up our rights and blessings for the sake of other interests. Help us to live unashamed of who we are, dedicated to maintain our ties to you and each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. If we were able to meet together, this would be the time in our service when all of us would bring our tithes and offerings. Since we are unable to meet in person, I would like to remind you to continue your support of the church and its ministries and missions. You can mail your offerings to the church, or if you would like to learn how to set up an automatic electronic transfer of funds from your account to the church, please call the church office during regular office hours. Another reminder, only one week remains for our annual Change for Change event to raise money for the Pregnancy and Parenting Support Center. If you have been collecting change, bring, please bring it to the church next Sunday. If you prefer, you can mail a check to the church marked Change for Change. Donations must be received by next Sunday, Father's Day, June 21st. Our Old Testament lesson today is a portion of Psalms 116, reading the first two verses and then verses 12 through 19. This psalm is subtitled, Thanksgiving for Recovery from Illness, which seems appropriate for our own time. Listen for God's word. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he inclined his ear to me. 
Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord in the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosened my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of all the house of the Lord. In your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join with me now in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Turning now to the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to start in chapter 9, verse 35, and read part of chapter 10 through verse 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Let the Lord bless the reading of this word. This week we start back in what is called the ordinary time in the church meaning that there's not special occasions going on like Easter or Pentecost or something like that. We are back to the normal daily lives. And so here we are starting today with a passage I believe is very timely for us now. There are two things Jesus does in this passage that I believe can help us value every single person. And the first thing could almost be overlooked. In fact, I almost did. We have the list of the 12 disciples here in this passage that Jesus chose. Now, I remember when I was young and in Sunday school, we were encouraged to memorize the names of these 12. And once we did that, we learned their names. Well, we really didn't go through much detail of who they were. Peter, John, yes, and of course Simon, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot. But other than that, we really didn't talk much about the other disciples. They were just names. 
And if you play Bible trivia, if you have them memorized, you've won. So when I got to this passage this week, I almost wanted to overlook that part and think, okay, just going to read them and leave it at that. But there is something much deeper to this list than just being a list of names. These were real people that for the Jewish world turned it upside down. These were 12 ordinary men. And when I say that, they were not the men who would look, be looked upon by the Jewish leaders to become leaders of the Jewish faith or leaders in the church. They would have been looked upon as, well, you have a job to do, just do it. We're not going to look highly on you. You just have your function, so be it. There was nothing special about these men for these Jewish leaders that would have stated that they would have turned the world upside down for the Christian faith. For instance, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were fishermen. They would never be looked on as more than providing food for people. Yes, they could go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They would not take roles, uh, leading roles in worship. Nor were they going to become rabbis. They would have just been common people. But the two that I really want to point out that are most interesting in this passage today are both Matthew and Simon the Canaanite. Matthew was a tax collector. And he was disliked by everybody. He was despised by the Jewish peoples for being a Jew who was willing to collect the taxes for Rome and for the leaders of both the Jewish and the Roman world. Well, they despised him because it was known that tax collectors would usually take a little bit more and pocket some of that for themselves. And so they were not trusted or liked by anyone. So we get to Simon the Canaanite, who in Luke and Mark is known as Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were a Jewish religious group, and they were militant. They fought to separate themselves from the ordered institutions of Rome and the way that Judaism seemed to be perceived at that time. They were not afraid to take the, well, to take a life or give their own up in a fight. And anyone who worked for the Romans, especially in the Jewish world, most likely would have lost their lives. So to think that Matthew and Simon both were part of this 12 is shocking. But Jesus saw potential in every single one of these 12. He saw them as ones who could truly live God's will in this world. He saw these men as ones who could be molded by the Holy Spirit in the ways that God has called people to live their lives. Now, the second thing I find in this passage that Jesus did was he himself went out and he also commanded his disciples to proclaim the gospel, teach the gospel, and offer healing to all. The statement Jesus makes about the harvest is very telling for this time. The Pharisees would look upon the common people as chaff, or unusable crop, weeds, or that which would not grow right. And they looked at that as being bur should be burned up. They didn't seem to care in that way. Jesus saw their need, the people's need for something more, to feel loved, to feel there was something more to life than just this. 
So when our passage states that Jesus had compassion, it means in the Greek that he had that compassion that was in the very depths of his being, to the very core of who he was. So when it says he had compassion, he felt their pain, their hunger, their loneliness, their sorrow, and that longing for God. And in that compassion, God has offered us salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection. And God gave them and us the command to proclaim, teach, and heal in God's name. So there is something in this passage that doesn't deal with just the healing of every disease and sickness. There is something about casting out demons. And demons has been become an interesting word over the years. Yes, many of us take it as a force of the evil one. But it can also mean more than that. As one commentator states, Greg Carey, we can relate to what it means to be bound by a power one feels powerless to resist. Such demons need not be found only in those people, but they can reside wherever evil has us firmly in its grip. Many, all, People find themselves bound by behaviors, patterns, or structures they cannot escape, often cursing themselves when they repeat the same behavior time and again. I would add to that idea that many, or as he said, all, people have these same behaviors, patterns, or structures at times built into us that we may not even know that they control us. We may not even think that a certain function as being wrong in God's eyes. And to make matters worse, there are times that some of these functions have been acted out in the name of God. Which leaves us with a sense that we need this deep compassion. Or others may feel that need for deep compassion because we have been the ones who caused their suffering. Can we not see that in the world today? As we look around us, tensions and anxieties are so high due to so many things like the global relations or lack thereof. Civic leaders embracing divisions instead of trying to find ways to bring us together. Race relations, both personal and systematic. Gender inequality, continued disparity between rich and poor getting worse. And yes, this is a, one that we don't think about as often now. There is still a division between the blue collar and white-collar workers, lifestyles, and beliefs. God sees value in each and every one of us, every single person. But when we allow any of these things, through both our action and inaction, to continue creating a chasm in these relations, well, we have to be honest that we don't always value each person as God does and wants us to. But we can be agents of change, and we must face the demons that haunt us. Greg Carey goes on to say, when we imagine the realm of exorcism, let us imagine liberation freedom from the powers that constrain us and prevent us from living full human lives. There is a verse in the Bible that can often be overlooked as well. 
John 20, verse 26, which states, A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Now, as I stated earlier, Jesus brought together a group of men which was not of the norm of that time, these 12, who diametrically opposed ordinary men, should not have been together, and many of them could have been enemies. And yet Jesus united them. But we get to the Gospel of John. And in this passage, Thomas has yet to believe that Jesus has risen. The other ten have seen Jesus. Thomas has not. Thomas believed the Jesus movement was dead, just as Jesus was. And here is a possibility for division to take hold. They could have run away, never looked back, just tried to find a way to live. But despite the difference over whether the fact that Jesus was living or not. We have 11 men in that room, still grounded in a fellowship that was deep in God because of Jesus Christ, giving each of them a chance to see the value in each other, especially the 10 with Thomas, or Thomas with the other 10. William Barclay states, The Pharisees in their pride looked for the destruction of sinners. Jesus, in love, died for the salvation of sinners. When we hold on to biases and behaviors that create problems with others, do we not fall in line with the Pharisees? We seek destruction. And as Christians, when we say that we should love one another as we love ourselves, it should be in our intention that everyone should be saved and offered the good news of Jesus Christ. That will mean rising above what creates a barrier in knowing the other who is before us. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take us out of our comfort zones to change. But since Jesus was able to take two natural enemies in Matthew and Simon and make them brothers, God through the Holy Spirit will help us change and grow and minister to the world. The door is wide open for us to go out and proclaim the gospel and to love in word and in deed. Will we go through that door? I know I will, with God's help. I'm willing to make the changes in my life to value everyone and be an agent of peace. I hope as we all will commit in that. May it be so. Amen.
As we prepare to join in prayer, I do want to bring out a joy because it's going to affect us next week as well. Also, it's a personal joy, but uh, on Thursday night, Jack Davison and Abigail Wolf both graduated from high school, and it was a pleasure to see both of them go through the line and get their diplomas. But the reason I'm bringing this out to you now is next Sunday during our service, The church, well, the fellowship uh, committee on behalf of the church are going to present them with brand new Bibles in saying, congratulations, we're proud of you. So please join us next Sunday during the worship. Share this with your friends and family to join us as we share in the joy of Jack and Abby. Let us join in prayer. O God, our Father, You call us all to be your children, brothers and sisters in Christ. You look at us all with so much value. You look at us all in love. And we thank you that you see so much potential in every one of us, no matter who we are, what we do. You want what is best for all of us. And and you came in Jesus Christ. And every week, we have to take that time to remind ourselves of why we are here. Because it is through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection that you save us. Taking on our sinful ways. And showing us you love us despite that. And offering us a life that goes beyond just that living in sin and offering us the Holy Spirit to remind us of your love, to offer us comfort and challenge, gifts and guidance, to be able to go out to preach and teach and heal where there is need. And when sinful ways came into being, you could have taken the action of saying, I'm going to redo everything. But out of love, you have continued to let us have life. And even though you don't like everything we do, you still give us the opportunity to come to you in the freedom to love. And we thank you for love, for you and for one another. So as we are in this world today, sometimes it's struggle to see that love being acted out. Whether it's in our own families, as we have that person or those people that we struggle with in the family to be able to understand that we just don't want to be around, whatever it may be, to cause isolation or conflict. 
to the global scale, where nations are not always talking to nations, and we're not looking to take swords to make them into plowshares, and everything in between. We see so much disparity in this world today that sometimes it's hard for us to not become numb, to know what to say, to even know what to do. Sometimes that gap seems so huge. Where do we begin? It begins with you, O oh God. It begins with us bringing ourselves before you. We want peace. We want love. We want to know one another. We don't want to see the differences anymore. We want to all get along. Sometimes the divisions and the chasms have become so deep we don't know how to change. So we've got to come to you in prayer. Help me change where I need to change. Help us change. Help us to be better societies. Help us to see and to do what you call us to do in this world today. Just as Jesus came and brought the 12 disciples together, 12 ordinary men, some of who should have never been together, and made them brothers. We know you can do the same with us today, making us see what it truly means to be brothers and sisters in the family of God. May that be our focus and our actions. And all this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be you thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen.
may the God of hope and justice guide us on our way so that we may do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and forevermore. Amen.